Finances Committee meeting for 2021. Councillors are all paying attention. Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> it's 9.30, so we're kicking off. I declare the meeting open. We shall stand to say the opening karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Ki a mā kina ki te uta. Ki a mā tarata ki tai. E hi ake ana te atakua. E tio, he huka, he hauhu, te hei mauri ora. Please note that this meeting is being live streamed and you have the opportunity to see it later on YouTube if you wish to do so. Please let me or Democracy Services, the, um, Democracy Services know if you intend leaving the meeting and we are scheduling morning tea for around 10.30 a.m. We have an apology from Mia Foster the Deputy Mayor may be here for a little time, but we need to accept an apology for her. And um, Councillor Wolf, who's currently at the hospital. Do I have a seconder, please? Councillor Condy, thank you. I put the motion, which has been moved and seconded. Please vote accordingly. Right. Oh, Councillor Wolf on Zoom, right. Yes, we currently have Councillor Wolf on Zoom, but he may not be here for the whole meeting. I call on members to declare any conflicts of interest they may have in relation to any items on the agenda. Okay. I move that we approve the minutes of the Regulatory Processes Committee meeting held on the 9th of December 2020. They be taken as, as read and confirmed as an accurate record of that meeting. A seconder, please. Councillor O'Neill, thank you. Please vote on this. Thank you, that was carried unanimously. There are no items not on the agenda. We have a, a few public participants this morning. I will introduce each of them when the time comes. We're starting off with a, um, Craig Pomari uh, um, speaking on Portmore Place, Traffic Resolution 1521. If you'd like to come to the table, Craig, and push the button on the microphone, and you have five minutes. If you want us to ask any questions, allow you need to allow time within that five minutes. I know it'll go fairly quickly. Thank you. That's good. Great. Uh, thank you, councillors, for your time this morning. Uh, I'm Craig Pormody. I'm a resident of Portmore Place in Granada Village. Uh, the proposal that came through from council was to install a stop sign at the corner of Granada Drive and Portmore Place. Uh, initially, I opposed uh, the submission for various reasons, but having seen some of the feedback, I'm now largely more ambivalent about whether the stop sign goes in. Um, but as I put on my slides there, the proposed solution didn't actually recognise the real issues uh, that are being faced uh, by residents coming out of Portmore Place. And when I went through all of the feedback, and when I, I'm not going to force you to read through the details, there were two clear issues that came through. Issue one is visibility when turning right out of Portmore Place into Granada Drive, and issue two, and there's a, I've just cut and pasted from everybody else's submissions. Issue two is the speed of traffic coming up Granada Drive. Uh, and so to my mind, the stop sign didn't address the issues. Uh, I put in my submission, I have to stop anyway, because that's common sense uh, when you get there because of uh, poor visibility. So if we look at this, this slide here, which is provided by council, the blue, uh, the big blue circle is where the stop sign would go. And so it's when you turn right into Granada Drive, uh, you have an issue with, uh, with visibility. Uh, I showed it this way by sitting in my car, uh, at the corner there, uh, you have less than about 20 metres visibility, unfortunately, because of the outcrop of rock from the house on the corner, which happens to be mine. Um, and it makes it very difficult. So you have to stop in order to be able to see what's coming up Granada Drive anyway. 
And then when you think it's clear, you've got to floor it to get around because it's actually quite a distance to get onto the far side and move to the right. So I estimated you've got a couple of seconds reaction time to, uh, to make that turn into Granada Drive. If I look at it this way, this is someone coming up Granada Drive towards Portmore Place. Uh, it's only when they're about 25 metres again from that road that they actually see that in fact there is a street uh, to the left, which is Portmore Place. So the issues raised by all the submitters, including, including myself, are one, it's visibility when turning right uh, is a significant issue, and it's the speed of traffic coming up Granada Drive. Uh, if anyone's doing 50, I'm happy to put a bet on that, uh, and I'm sure I'd win that when I doubt they're doing that. Uh, we've got the usual boy races, as everybody else does, uh, who are doing anything but 50. Uh, we were pleased, though, to see that uh, once the officers had seen it, their response uh, effectively was to say actually speed management signs would be better going up Granada Drive. Uh, I've suggested there perhaps to the addition of uh, potentially a speed bump at about the point where Portmore Place is first visible as you come up Granada Drive. The thinking behind that is signs, particularly for the residents there, you become oblivious to the signs that are there because they're there all the time. Uh, but a speed bump is something you must slow down for. And at that position, which is about 25 metres from the corner, it's at a point where those waiting on port and wanting to turn right can actually see somebody at the speed bump. That car slows down, it gives them an opportunity to turn right without endangering their lives. Uh, so that was, uh, those are all the slides that I had. Uh, for me, again, the key issue was uh, two things. One is visibility when turning right. Second is the speed of traffic coming up Granada Drive. Uh, I see, as I say, the officers have addressed uh, and recognised those issues, which I'm grateful for. Whether the stop sign goes in or not, I could care, I could care less. I stop anyway because I have to, because I'm not going to throw my uh, hands in the life of an idiot driving quickly up Granada Drive. So thank you for the opportunity to submit. I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Craig, thank you for that. Can you um, have officers indicated whether they would consider a speed speed hump? Oh, actually, I'll ask a question before that. What sort of slope is there at this point? Because obviously if, if there's too much slope, then I believe they won't consider a speed hump anyway. But uh, 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 um, uh, are cars coming uphill at this point before they along Granada Drive? They are. It starts to level out slightly. Uh, sorry, if I bring that view up there. It starts to, at the end of the shadow, fortunately this was taken in the morning, it starts to level out slightly, but yes, it is It is uphill. It's not a steep gradient um, at that point, and that's, I think, partly why cars do speed up, is because, of course, it is a gradient, and they feel they need to put their foot down to get up the hill. But no, they didn't address the issue of a speed bump in their uh, response, even though I had suggested that. Okay, so we, we will have the opportunity to ask them that when, when um, the actual traffic re resolution is discussed. So Great. thank you for that. Thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate your time. Thanks. We now have John Wolfe on Zoom speaking to us about Holloway Road. Uh, Good morning, councillors. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, as you're aware, Holloway Road is a very narrow street and your traffic management people have come up with an excellent engineering solution. Um, and I'm simply calling in to say, to ask that you implement it as at, at the proposal in its entirety. Um, you know, as you know, we've, we've had a couple of fires up there that the fire engines haven't been able to get up to. I was in an ambulance um, early last year that had difficulty getting out of the street. Um, and regularly we have rubbish trucks that can't collect on the um, appointed day because of um, uh, being blocked by traffic. Uh, so I, I guess I, I just want to uh, is there any is there any concerns that you have about implementing the proposal as it's written? John, we will discuss this later. This time is for you to speak to us, and um, 
Is there anything more you wish to say? Uh, no, nothing beyond asking that you implement the proposal as it's presented by your traffic engineers. Okay, appreciate your time on that. Councillor Condi has a question for you. Hi, Thank John, you. thanks for joining us. Um, I understand that there was uh, quite a lot of community um, organisation around this proposal, that there was a residence group. Can you, were you involved with that? Could you tell us anything more about that? Um, the work that kind of the neighbours have done on this proposal? Yes, um, there was a residence group. There was about uh, three or four of us. We met your traffic engineers on um, a few occasions on the street. Um, and when the proposal came out, I went round and made or asked, emailed round and asked that everyone respond to it. And I see from the feedback that you've had a, a pretty good response. Um, it's um, virtually um, all in total support of it. And in fact, I noticed um, other people or residents also asking for additional yellow lines, which is probably outside what has been proposed. Um, and also there's, there's uh, we're also talking about our parking options in the street because Holloway Road has the problem that we get a lot of park and rides there. And we also get people in downtown apartments that don't have um, car parks that are using the street for long-term parking. So uh, the, the residents are now pretty actively um, discussing those options as well. But the key thing for us right now, the the street is being resealed, I think, as we speak. Um, and now is the opportunity to um, put the yellow lines in as, as is proposed by your traffic people. <laughs> yeah. Um, pardon? Are you having a good holiday wherever you are? I am. I'm I'm parked in a camper van on the shores of Lake Wanaka. And um it's been marvelous being down the South Island um at this time with no overseas tourists here. Uh, the uh, Catland areas were stunning and it, it's been beautiful. There's no one down here and there's very light traffic on the roads. Good, enjoy it while we work on your behalf. Yes, do. do. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you for taking the time out of your holiday to speak to us about this um, issue, which is obviously very close to home. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Okay, we have um, Dean here, Dean Halifax, to speak to us on Abel Smith Street. Welcome to the table, Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Again, you have five minutes, and if you want questions addressed, allow it within that time. Okay, what happens here? Oh, it's obvious what happens. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, this opportunity. The issue that I am raising is, is, is a kind of an odd issue, and it's to do with uh, the process that has been used, and it's not necessarily about the substantive uh, um, matter of the proposal. If you look at this first slide, the, uh, your officer has said, how can I help, uh, at the bottom. In the uh, second point I have made above, um, I refer to the officer's uh, comment made after my submission and it says that the um, the the submission I made uh, was not necessarily uh, something that needed to be considered and in fact had been had been resolved with the provider of the um, the, the service that was going to be uh, installed in Abel Smith Street, which is a share park uh, spot. My submission uh, was 
about the inappropriate nature of the exact spot due to a large tree, which drops a lot of garbage and has been detrimental to my car when it has been parked there. And I pointed out in my submission that the, um, the spots, if used by a share car provider, will have the same detrimental effects on their cars. Uh, and I asked for, um, when, when the officer, uh, when the officer responded, he says to me that, as you can see there in point two, that there is no need to use evidence in making this decision. It is not, that's, it's, those are his words there, it is not an evidence issue. And so my, my response to him obviously was, how can you make a decision without evidence? I've asked for the evidence that you've used um, to conclude that the, uh, the car parking spot in question is appropriate and you have told me that no evidence is needed. So here we have the, his exact words. These spaces have been selected in conjunction with the providers of the car share service and the trees are considered unlikely to significantly affect the provision of the service to an unacceptable quality. I asked for evidence and he told me, no, nah, you don't get any evidence. So I've asked again for evidence of how this uh, conclusion could be reached. If you have no evidence, how do you reach a conclusion that it's an acceptable spot? Uh, I have had no further communication with that officer. And uh, I wanted to raise this matter with you because if you're making a decision about where a car parking spot should go, you should take into consideration the appropriateness of the particular car parking spots in uh, question. So I've said, at the bottom there, the reason that I am not, uh, the reason that I am pushing this matter is that I have experienced significant detrimental effects to my car and I'd like to avoid others suffering the same fate, especially as the solution is so simple, either trim the tree or select other spots. Here endeth the epistle. <laughs> Would you mind putting that back up again? So I would, sure. would take a photo of it so we can um, ask officers that question. So um, I need to be clear that I'm not opposing a car parking, a share parking. Um, I am simply saying that the spot chosen is not a good spot unless some other work is done. Choose any other spot, maybe 20 metres away. I don't know how that would affect uh, um, the provision, but certainly uh, it's it's not appropriate, that's what it's in. It's the, the spot that's being pro proposed. Any quick questions for Dean in the remaining few seconds? Otherwise we will ask, discuss that with officers um, at a later stage when the matter comes to us. Thank you for Thank that, you. Dean. Um, um, I, I just want to make the point again that it's evident, you need evidence. You can't just say you can make this decision with no evidence. Appreciate that. Thank you. We have Mike Mallow and is Alan Blake here? Mike, welcome to the table. Do you know the drill? You have um, 10 minutes. Over to you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Kia ora. Um, it's just me. So uh, it's not, we're, we're not a double act, unfortunately. Sorry about that. Um, we want to talk about um, Swan Lane, about Island Bay, and um, about Custom House Key. I'll start off with Swan Lane. Um, that's the one that Ellen was going to talk about, so it's <laughs> just once over lightly. Um, you won't be surprised that we support it. Um, you won't be surprised that we support all of the three we're talking about. Um, the, the main comment we have is, please, can we go a bit further? And Swan Lane, that's uh, reflected in the comments uh, where they're I think that they're universe, universally positive and universally saying a great start. Um, so please, please carry on with that. One thing that's notable about the, the officers' report, and it's really good the way the officers are replying in detail to the uh, um, 
submissions um, is that it refers to pedestrian accessibility, um, which is a key part of the um, urban, uh, your urban planning, but rarely gets referred to in traffic resolutions. Pedestrian safety does, but pedestrian uh, uh, accessibility, which is, which is vital, doesn't. So it's really good. So uh, lots of ticks there, but a, a few more on the way, please. Um, Island Bay. Uh, that is a, a really good initiative. Um, we suggest it could be better by um, putting it on a, on a speed platform and the council, the officers say no. One of the reasons they say no is you can't do it uh, because it affects buses, uh, bus passengers. Um, that's true if it's not, not properly designed. If it's well designed so the buses go over it at the speed which is designed for, um, it's actually uh, perfectly feasible, um, but it's um, irrelevant in this case because it's not on a bus route. Um, so, uh, and the third one is Custom House Key, which is once again a, a step in the right direction. Um, yes, please, let's have a, 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 a footpath there. Uh, there's a comment from the officers there that an extra crossing would slow down pedestrian crossing of Custom House Key. Um, the uh, precise words are, put it here somewhere. Um, uh, an additional crossing would impose longer delays to pedestrians at other intersections along the waterfront arterial. Now, we don't understand that. Uh, surely the fewer crossings, the greater the delay, because uh, you've got to walk towards them and uh, you'd have more people crossing at a time. So those are just comments, but uh, the overall is, um, yes, please do them. Uh, please, um, please do them, more of them, and please do more about the ones you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for your very positive submission there. Mark, on behalf of Living Street Saratera, any questions from councillors? Right, well, okay. Thank you again. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Do we have Russell Taylor here? Russell, welcome to the table, speaking on Holloway Road. You have five minutes and opportunity within that to for allow councillors to ask questions of you. Over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving us the time. Um, I appreciate that um, you're busy people and that a lot of this is quite minor stuff for you to deal with in terms of the other things you have on your plate. I'm here basically to support the proposal um, and <coughs> I um, unfortunately was busy and was not available to be in the reference group, but this has been an issue which has been going on for a long time. And particularly what I wanted to raise is that it's unfortunate in the proposal it doesn't show where existing yellow lines are gazetted and marked, and some of which in fact are um, incorrectly marked. Um, and I do think that it, there's need for a little bit more work to be done on the proposal. I also have been in quite uh, frequent correspondence and dialogue with uh, council officials in relation to this. And um, I note in reading the submissions attached to your paper that there's lots of points which are made which are not rebutted by the council officers in making the recommendation. They have not responded to the submissions of the residents and um, people who are not resident but have made um, comments. I'd like to turn to page four of the proposal, I think you have the same number, which relates to the what we call the choke points within the street, um, <coughs> by Bullet Track, by the Yellow Cottage, and by the number 40, and number 40 is the um, narrowest point in the whole street, and <coughs> there is it's unfortunate that it's not shown on the um, photograph or mentioned in the um, detail that <coughs> those are the three points where it's most important to have yellow lines um, for no parking and it would be really important um, that they are there because outside number 40 down to um, basically 36 um, there should be yellow lines. And down at 32 and between 34 and 32, which is the narrowest point in the street, um, 
that should be yellow lines right through that area rather than at the moment where there's a break in the middle to enable people to park outside number 32. The, we then get to the areas um, where I don't quite understand how the proposal has come about and if you go to page five um, <coughs> in relation to 60 to 52, um, and I see Roger Bolam has made a submission in relation to that, who owns the property at 56. Um, the street is quite wide there, and I've not in my 40 years of living in Holloway Road ever seen an incident where vehicles have not been able to pass there um, with people parking on both sides of the road. Um, and I see that the council officers haven't in their little agenda at the end responded to that. I live at 84 Holloway Road. Recently we had the whole footpaths redone and I'm particularly concerned about the restrictions on parking outside 86 and 84, which are proposed in this, because there the street is um, wide enough to cope with parking on both sides of the road. Um, it is currently, I've done a whole lot of measurements um, <coughs> and it's 6.65 metres wide there and there's room for cars on both sides of the road, it seems to me. Then we get right up to the top of the street at page um, six um, when it's proposing yellow lines um, from 106 to 84 on the eastern side of the road. Um, and I find it, um, <coughs> it's unfortunate that the existing yellow lines are not shown, but um, there's never been a issue with the road being blocked in that part of the street, and I'm not sure that the yellow lines are on the right side of the road. And I'm not sure if I really understand the logic of having um, no parking lines where there's ample space because it's an open channel and there's no footpath and cars could park on the eastern side. Um, and <coughs> yet the yellow lines are put on the eastern side, not the western side and that seems a bit unusual. So those are the specific points that I wanted to make in relation to it. And there's a general issue that I wanted to raise and that is in the whole issue of consultation and getting council officers to move on things. Um, this was first raised by residents of Street in 1979 uh, <coughs> and the records that I've found um, we had a meeting with a um, whole lot of councillors in June of 2017 and we were assured then that things were going to happen straight away. They haven't. It's taken a long, long time to get this done. And that the issue is not just with the parking, the issue is with signage, the issue is with speed restrictions and particularly the white lines don't, which do not require gazetting and it, has been a submission of people in the street, myself particularly, that there should be the inclusion of white lines that are marking how far out on the street people can park and where there's parking outside particular, um, the little boxes around driveways. Okay, Russell, we have run out of time. Yep. Thank you for that. We will raise various issues there with officers when we discuss this later, so thank you for your Presentation. Yeah, just just one question is, is I had a meeting with the traffic engineers this morning about the resealing of Holloway Road, and I see in this proposal that the marking is going to be done in the next three months. My understanding is the sealing won't be done within that time, and that it might well be an issue where the street will have to be um, painted twice. And it seems to me that that's an unnecessary cost, and it would be better to wait until the resealing is done. Thank you. That makes sense. We will follow that through too. Thank you. Jonathan Coppard from Cycle Wellington. As a, representing an organisation, you have 10 minutes. Welcome, Jonathan. Over uh, to you. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Cool. Yes. You've pushed um, the microphone is on, is it? Yep, I think yep. so. Um, all right, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Councillors. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I come to speak. I also want to check if I can speak to a traffic resolution as well. Yeah, cool. Um, so I'd like to speak to the traffic resolution um, TR03 on the terrace. 
Um, so I arrived at the council office yesterday by bicycle, which is a form of transport you'll want to support. Um, and I found there's a sign on your property now saying that I'm not allowed to lock my bike uh, on the one railing, which is a safe place to park a bicycle on, I might be this entire street. Um, all the poles, you can lift them out the ground so they could just hook, hook the lock off them. Um, and then there's also railings which people need to use to get up and down the stairs, um, which is not really an acceptable place to lock my bike. Um, so I was concerned with this traffic resolution that you are, um, I really support the movements with the accessibility about improving the accessible parking. Um, but I'm just concerned that you're replacing the accessible parking with more general parking. Now on my way down the terrace here, I passed about 30 or so um, places to park a car. If I'd driven this morning, I would probably have no trouble finding a place to park. Um, but because I chose to bike, I couldn't find a place to, to park my bicycle acceptably. So under the parking policy, uh, you're supposed to um, consider bicycle parking as one of the options for the street. Um, and I would note that there is currently no um, bicycle parking provided by the council on this entire street. Um, so I think you should consider putting bicycle parking in that spot instead of general parking. Regarding the uh, Garrett Street and Swan Lane, um, I think this is a really awesome improvement. I was really surprised when I saw it pop up. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really great. Um, I think it could go further in a few ways. Um, the key key thing uh, I think is an issue, so we went down there actually and we had a look at the street, um, watched where pedestrians were moving, how cyclists were traveling. Um, and the section where Swan Lane and Garrett Street intersect with Cuba Street, I think is really key. Um, it, Currently, already, it acts as a crossing point because it's a break in the parked cars, so people can cross between those gaps where there's no parked cars in the way. Um, and when I was watching them, people are crossing in all directions. So they're crossing diagonally because they want to go up the street, not just, not everyone is just traveling from Swan Lane to Garrett Street or up Cuba, right? People are traveling in diagonals, traveling from one side of the street to the other. Um, and I'm concerned that the interface that the officers have decided to put in on the street um, is actually going to limit accessibility for pedestrians and that it's going to require them to cross at one designated point um, at, at right angles to the road. Um, council officers replied to me uh, to say that they w that this was just a sort of, um, they needed to address this area in some way. Um, and I just think they're going about addressing it in the wrong way. Um, the sort of limiting the pedestrian movements is actually going to be uh, counterintuitive and that's going to if you're driving down that street and you know pedestrians are going to be waiting at the spot where you know they are, you're going to move faster because you know where they are, you're expecting them. If it's if it was, as I suggested in my uh, feedback in, uh, to this traffic resolution, that you were to put a raised crossing in at that point on Cuba Street as well, then that would uh, slow down vehicles, it would make it safer for cyclists who are traveling down that street at 30 kilometers per hour, um, and it would make it easy for people to cross the road in the ways that they actually want to cross the road, rather than in the way that you're saying this is the one way you can get across. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you very much for that. Questions from councillors? Perhaps you have been very clear in the points you have made to us. So thank you for taking the time to come in. Thank you very Appreciate much. That. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, for once we're running ahead of time, but that, that's all good. So we will move on to general business. Item 2.1, name for the private right of way in Island Bay. We'd like to, um, I'd like to invite officers Carleen Thomas and Michael Brownie to the table for this item and for the next one. So any questions of councillors in regard to this? It is a very straightforward issue, isn't it? And there don't seem to be lots of questions um, on our minds, well, um, okay, I'll say what I have to say, that's Ara Pai Kawakawa is the recommended name for this new private right of way on Island Bay, and it has agreement from all parties. You do have a question, Councillor Matthews. Sorry. Right, right yep, okay. <laughs> it has agreement from all parties concerned the name has relevance to the area, so I move the recommendations in the officer's report. Is there a seconder for this motion? Councillor Matthews. 
Would you like to speak at this point? I, I just want to say thank you. We've been, um, this committee has been asking for more to be our Māori names, so it's really exciting to see you respond to that desire, and um, yeah, it's great to see. So thank you. We're happy to support it. Yeah. Right, any further comments? Councillor O'Neill. Um, just very briefly, yeah, and thank you for all your work. I just wanted to um, point out a little detail in the report that I thought was really sweet. So the um, Pai Kawakawa um, comes from the name of the local stream, and although that the, the stream is piped, um, it's noted in the report that um, eels have been known to swim back up the stream like they would pre-colonial times, and there's a lovely story there. Um, and uh, having gone to Island Bay, I know that it's one of the significant streams that kids talk about when, when they're learning about marine life in the area with the school. So, yeah, just to add that little detail and um, note that, it, that it's going to be a pretty excellent special learning opportunity as well. OK, thank you for that. I now put the motion, which has been moved and seconded. Please vote accordingly. Thank you, carried unanimously. Item 2.2, same officers here to answer questions about the minor amendment of the suburb boundary um, between Glenside and Churton Park. Any questions for officers on this? Well, just one, we do, ha we do now have agreement from the Churton Park Community Association. Is that correct? Because they may have had concerns because they, this limits, yeah, they may have had concerns. I'll just leave it at that. So we have had agreement from them. Oh, correct. An email was received uh, late last night from the, secretary, uh, the president of the um, Churton Park Community Association. Good stuff. There being no further questions, what we're doing here is simply completing the issue we discussed at some length at our October regs meeting when we requested officers to investigate how the suburb boundary between Churton Park and Glenside might be, and I quote, improved by minor technical adjustment. And this is what this report is about. The suburb boundary has been fine-tuned so that each property and given streets is in one suburb or the other, as clearly defined on the map in our agenda. And there are many suburbs in Wellington where some houses are in one suburb and others in another suburb, so this is nothing new. And both the community associations support it, so on that basis I move the recommendations. Do I have a seconder, please? Councillor Condi, do you wish to speak? Okay, no debate. I put the motion which has been moved and seconded. Please vote. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good to see you're still with us, Councillor Wolf. Right. Thank you, officers. We thought that would be fairly straightforward, and it proved to be. Right. Well, we'll move on to the proposed road closures. I'd like to invite officers Maria Tomo and Sean, Sean Woodcock to the table for councillors to ask any questions we might have. Again, this is all pretty straightforward. There don't seem to be, doesn't seem to be a single question. Okay, well. One question, <laughs> one question. How complicated is it for you to um, address the, these um, issues when they come through? Well, they're not exactly issues, but a lot of them are repeat. So do, they, do the repeat ones um, involve anything new, or do they simply, um, is it rubber stamping from one year to the next, it effectively? like the Gaisley and the Round the Bays. Like, we've got the Penguin things to look at now. We've got all that stuff going with um, people, friendly, people with penguins who we liaise with and the PSR people who we liaise with. So there's always something new coming up with different to make sure we cover off. Communication, of course, we're always trying to improve communications with all of them. 
and we, you know, we still always, every time, trying to improve our communication to area for all the road closures. There's, a, yeah, there's it's always a, new yeah, things, eh? Certainly a lot of moving parts and, and yeah. um, none of the, um, I suppose, uh, interests of parties are ever taken for granted as well. So try and engage with as many as possible. So yeah. it does provide quite a bit of work. Well, we appreciate all the time you put into it and we appreciate it even if we don't have a lot of questions to ask of you. Thank you again. So we're being asked to approve road closures for four city events here, all bar the Peachy Keen Festival being repeat events. There have been no objections to road closures for any of these, neither have there been council officers concerns that traffic will be impeded unreasonably if the approved traffic management plans are carried out. Therefore, I move we accept officers' recommendations. A seconder, please. Councillor Condi, thank you. Anything you wish to say? Just to quickly say that Peach Keen looks awesome. Yeah. And I might go. <laughs> no debate. Okay. Bearing in mind what has um, been said, I move the motion which has been moved and seconded. Please vote accordingly. Thank you again. Thank you, officers. Thank you for all the work you do. Thank, Thank you. you. Is that really the time? I can't believe we're so <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll move on to the next item, um, which is item two four: Custom House Key Parking Changes and Proposed Traffic Resolution. We'll invite officers to the table. Um, Charles Kingsford and Soon Tech Kong for any questions from councillors. And once questions have been completed, I will hand over to Councillor Condi to introduce the report. Questions for officers? Councillor O'Neill. I just have a, um, a quick question more about process. Uh, when we remove parking spaces and then are adding in a footpath, what kind of urban design goes into it to make sure that the footpath is even or um, not raised in a strange way? Uh, Councillor O'Neill, is this re regarding this particular traffic or in general? The, uh, sorry, I was just looking at the, this is item 2.4, yeah, the, um, just looking at the new footpaths under Custom House Quay, not just just in general, yeah. my Th curious. This particular traffic resolution was part of uh, a waterfront shade 10 uh, development. And as part of that, the urban design perspective of it was, was included as part of the whole project. So the parking spaces will have to be removed because uh, the, the urban design uh, requirement was uh, linking the pedestrian crossing to a, a, a signalised crossing at that point. So, yeah. so okay. it, it was included as part of the total uh, look at. Yeah. yeah, cool. No, that's all good. Okay, there being no further questions, I'll hand over to Councillor Condi. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, um, this little bit of additional footpath is needed because of course Site 9 development on that site is getting underway. Um, and which is very exciting. Uh, so that's it, it's a pretty straightforward little piece of, of pedestrian crossing, uh, sorry, of, of footpath here that we need. Um, just to acknowledge Mike Mellow coming in and, and talking to us about you know um, considerations for an additional crossing there. I think um, when I was speaking to officers, this is this intersection is one of the ones that's on um, the radar of the Let's Get Wellie Moving City Streets program. Uh, given that the MRT corridor goes down here. So there is going to be, um, it, hopefully in the near future, a significant review looking at, at this intersection, um, which would allow us to look at that at that point. Um, that's all I have to add on this one. Do you wish to speak? Any debate? Okay, I put the motion which has been moved and seconded. Please vote accordingly. Thank 
Thank you. Item 25, which is the Swan Lake, Cuba Street and Garrett Street. The parking change is there and we have had um, comments from public participants in regard to this. Any questions from councillors for officers here? Councillor Condi. Um, can we just have uh, some officer comment in response to Jonathan Coppard's concern that essentially we're funneling pedestrians into one one clear crossing point across Cuba Street here, and that that is going against some of the design lines that we see at the moment, um, and whether that um, potentially encourages greater vehicle speed along there, and, and sort of just why we've de you've decided on that particular design element of, of where the pedestrians are crossing Cuba Street? Um. So when we started looking at this project, one of the one of the main concerns was to increase visibility at the intersection between Garrett Swan and Cuba Street. Um, so the solution that we came with was adding in curb build-outs and planting beds, and removing some parking, which would open up that intersection for a greater visibility. And we're we're saying this for pedestrians, cyclists, and vehicles. Um, in addition, the curb build-outs would help to narrow the carriageway visibly, which we would, we had advice from traffic engineers that would likely lower speeds, not increase speeds. Um, and recently that area was part of the 30K um, speed reduction in Central City. So I think with all those combination of things, uh, we felt there was an overall positive change. And um, as the submitter did say, we, we also acknowledged there was a lot of people crossing diagonally across the street. Um, and we noticed quite a few people were crossing at the, the point where cars were turning. Um, and so there was conflicts between pedestrians and vehicles. So we felt putting a dedicated crossing point would be a safer option. And is also providing an accessible crossing point across Cuba Street, which there really isn't at the moment. So it was trying to accommodate all those factors into, you know, into the design of that space. Um, there was a couple of submissions who were asking about um, whether we couldn't just close off access to, I think, the Swan Lane side of, of that service lane. Can you talk about why we need to maintain vehicle access at the moment and what the possibilities for that might be in the future? Um, so at the moment, Wilson's Parking operate the car park um, and they have vehicle access or legal vehicle access from Swan Lane. Um, as part of the traffic regs, you can access from um, service lanes or roads, and it's preferred in the document that it's from service lane, and there's also existing use rights on that access. So we are working with Wilsons to see what positive change we can make, but there's nothing um, actionable that we can do at the moment. So we need to sort of work with those constraints. Thank you. And my final question, um, a number of our uh, sub submitters sort of said that they found that the proposal in front of them, the traffic resolution, a bit underwhelming. And I just wanted to, to ask you guys to, to tell us a bit more about how this is just one step in the project and that actually we've got a lot more kind of of the detailed designs coming out because some of the councillors won't have been part of that. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, that's a really good point, and it is sort of the first step um, in terms of implementing the larger project. And what we're planning to do is hold a, um, a drop-in session in the next couple of months for stakeholders and community members to give them an update on the larger project that this sits within. Um, so as part of the traffic resolution, we tried to hint at some of the larger details in the project, um, but we didn't include the full scope of actually what's going to happen. Um, but there's a whole lot of great placemaking elements. So. Um, as, as Liam mentioned, um, some planting, we've got some water sensitive design, new paving, new lighting, um, new seating, some great sort of um, heritage interpretation artwork and um, commemorative um, elements as well to the history of the area. So it should be a really great place making project. Yeah. Sorry officers, I should have asked you to introduce yourselves. I believe you're from the city design and planning, is that correct? And Apologies, I'm Crystal Fallop, I'm the urban design manager. And Liam Farrell, team leader for public space delivery. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Welcome to the table. We have a thank question you. from Councillor Young. Actually, well, I'll, I'll make it a question so that it fits in with standing orders. Um, <laughs> can you just explain um, to my colleagues um, about the um, Glover Park um, 
But the Glover Park will finally recognize the man who donated the money to it and a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Do you want to take that? Sure. Hi. Thanks, Councillor Young. Um, so when we started this project, it was, it was focused just on the streetscape and didn't include Glover Park. Uh, when we started talking with our other teams, we wanted to make the interface with Glover Park and the street upgrade better. Um, so we brought some of the streetscape into the into the park. At that time, um, we had a request from two members of the public about doing something to recognise uh, Mr Glover, who had given funds, I don't know, back in the 70s? <laughs> back in the 70s to develop a public space, which, which Glover Park was sort of developed from. Um, so we worked quite closely with our heritage team. Um, they did a lot of research on... Lewis Glover and, and what he had done and... <laughs> this is particularly for Simon Close. Wolf. Simon, Simon uh, who we've had this out before. Um, so Dennis Glover has no connection to Wellington. This is Lewis Glover who was a trade unionist and he left his bicycle to the mayor and his glasses to the town clerk yeah. and, and all this money for a park. And so um, the two members of the public uh, approached me about getting proper recognition, which I think is really great because if I was going to leave that sort of amount of money to the city, I'd like to make sure people know which young it is. Oh, Council Councillor Young, I'm more, I'm more than aware now. Thank you. <laughs> so um, our, our research, uh, we found the original will uh, from Mr Glover. So we took an excerpt from that will and we're going to engrave that um, on one of the bench seats that we're putting in Glover Park. So, yeah, so he'll be acknowledged with a signature. I'll hand over to Councillor Condi to introduce the report. Thank you. Um, this is a really exciting to see traffic resolution. I just, um, you know, the laneways projects have, have been underway for a long time and I want to acknowledge Councillor Young who's joining us today um, and all the work that she's put into the laneways projects because this is really great to start seeing these things come to fruition. And we talk a lot about we need more city green spaces. Um, when we're talking about spatial plan and, and the increasing density we're seeing and, and seeing how these spaces then connect to places like Glover Park that we already have and make those better for the city is really exciting. Um, I do just want to acknowledge that, that what we've got in front of us is sort of the technical elements um, in the traffic resolution of what's going on and that there's a lot more work that we're excited to see um, from the design and place planning team um, about how all of this concept is going to come together. It looks really, really exciting. Um, just to acknowledge a couple of the comments, I want to thank you for your comments about how the design of the crossing of Cuba Street is actually going to make it safer and easier for accessible, uh, more accessible for wheelchair users um, and safer for pedestrians um, as well as, as cyclists. Um, you know, acknowledge that, you know, it would be lovely if we could close part of Swan Lane. I think, you know, that would be nice to be able to bring that into the into the public realm a bit more for pedestrians. Um, but, you know, it was really interesting to that I didn't know that, that Cuba Street and the district plan has specific rules that, that kind of discouraged um, driveways entering straight onto Cuba Street. Um, and once you know that, it's, I suddenly go, oh, that's one of the things that gives Cuba Street actually its character, that, that you don't have those driveways, you've got the, the storefronts, you don't have have, um, have to worry as a pedestrian that there are vehicles crossing. And it's th it was something thinking about as we're going into reviewing the district plan, that something like that that sits in the district plan actually has such an e effect on the character of the street without you really realising that it's there. Um, so that was an interesting bit of learning from this project for me. Um, so I think, you know, obviously we have that desire long term, but what we can do now is, is here and it looks great. And it was great to see um, so many people in the community coming out to, to um, support the traffic resolutions and the changes. So um, that said, I would like a seconder, please. Matthews? Yes, I will speak briefly. Um, just to say, um, I know that AAG was involved in this project right at the beginning and looking at um, accessibility issues. And while it, you know, hasn't kind of necessarily become the, the model accessibility project that they wanted, that those um, factors are kind of deeply ingrained in the work. And um, I'm, you know, uh, pleased to see that there was inquiry done about mobility parking in this, and it wasn't, you know, right for this area 
area, but um, really uh, pleased to see it happen. Um, before I became boring and moved to the suburbs, I lived in Feltex Lane, and I know there's a lot of housing around there now, and so these spaces are extremely important. That was, you know, I used to kind of go to Glover Park often, and... Um, no, not to, you know, have a drink, but to, you know, we'll get some sunshine. And, um, yeah, just, and I kind of echo those comments about um, the potential for us to do more pedestrianisation and um, having recently been in Auckland and seeing how much of the CBD is pedestrianised, it's absolutely amazing. So, you know, it's kind of these, we're sort of laying the groundwork to be able to do more. So thank you very much for your work, officers. Um, I'm happy to support this. Thank you. Any further debate? Otherwise, we shall vote. Again, unanimous. Yeah, thank you, officers, for all the work you've done in regard to this. And it would now be an appropriate time for us to go to a morning tea before we get into the next exciting instalment of traffic resolutions. We'll come back at, um, well, 20, 20 to te 11.
Welcome back. Traffic resolutions, item 2.6. We have officers at the table for any questions to be addressed to them, and I think we made some notes on some of the issues that the public participants raised, which no doubt will be um, directed to officers' ways, officers' way in just a moment. So, any questions from councillors? Well, I made some notes, if I can, if I can find them. <laughs> the public participants on right the the points raised by Dean Halifax, Sable Smith Street. I just made a note here about the the trees. What is your response to his concern about the trees? Or has that already been covered in the report? Right, we'll leave it to them, shall we? So we, we need to investigate further the trimming of the tree and what is the detritus and the leaf foliage that's dropping that's giving Dean Halifax a concern about the um, preference for these spaces to be car share spaces. We've got a confirmation on that from our parks team as yet. Okay, thank you. And on Holloway Road, Russell Taylor said something about he felt not, more work needed to be done on this and then he... Okay. And then he asked about the resealing and the painting of white lines twice. Have we got that under control so that there isn't a duplication of work there? He did, he did ask for um, parking bays to be marked and our bars to be put in. And our policy, if you call it, we, we've gone back to the residents to ask, do you want our bars placed outside your driveways to indicate where parking is allowed up to. So I understand that's already been put in place. I, I got the impression he was saying that white lines are going to be painted. I got the impression it's in the middle of the road, I don't know. But there are going to be white lines painted, then it's going to be resealed, and then white lines are going to be painted again. And he was questioning the whole process there. I, Yeah, there is on, on on page four there is an indication shown for a centre line marking um, at the lower end of Holloway Street. I think that was proposed as part of this TR work. Now the centre line doesn't need a TR, it's just something that we do to manage traffic and keep them to the right side of the road, you know, the left hand side of the road. But we will coordinate this road marking and the new traffic resolution, the broken yellow lines, if they're passed today, with obviously the road resealing. It could be that if the road resealing is imminent, we will wait until that's done. Okay, thank you for that. And the other one was um, Jonathan Coppard's question about more bike parking spaces. Is that something that you can provide an answer to? I think uh, TR03 on the terrace, I think you, yeah, certainly we can look at more cycle parking. It wouldn't be probably on the on the road itself, it would be on the, on the, on the footpath where it was obviously safer. But the actual, on page three of the TR03 report, we we're actually re just relocating a mobility park that's further up the terrace, uh, closer down towards, closer north towards the traffic signals where it's a flatter pat platform. So we're not actually removing a space and putting it into metered parking, we're actually putting it into a mobility park and relocating the loading zone. So I think you were slightly, might have been a slight misunderstanding there. But we can look at, obviously, with the cycle team, um, yep. cycle provision, especially outside the council building, which is probably, um, yeah, important. Right. Thank you. Questions? 
Otherwise, I'll hand over to Councillor Condy. So we all. Thank you. All right. So we've got. Uh, a good whack of traffic resolutions today. I'm going to kind of take them in batches. Um, there's three that I kind of think of as a bit of a package that we've got today, which is the Makra Road, the Saar Street and the Holloway Road. Now, all of these roads are um, quite narrow, wi winding roads that we've had issues with access on and, and we have concerns about the potential for kind of head-on collisions. So these are all areas where... Um, our, tra our traffic engineers have gone through and, and looked at where do we need to add broken yellow lines to make sure that there's enough room for vehicles to pass safely. And as we heard about in Holloway Road, making sure that there's enough room for an ambulance to get, get through or a fire truck or a garbage truck. Um, and I just want to acknowledge all the work that the officers have done, um, particularly on Makara Road, but also in other places of working with the residents who live there to try and make sure that where we can safely keep parking, that we've done that. Um, and, and worked really well with them because normally when we're taking out a lot of parking like all of these three, we would get a lot of community pushback. And the fact that actually what we've seen in these submissions is a lot of community support, I think is a credit to all the work that the officers have done to go out and speak to the community and all the residents affected. So I just wanted to thank you all for that. Um, the one thing I would just acknowledge is that we're having, we're making a slight change to the one on Holloway Road. Um, there's one parking space that's on Holloway Road that is not actually long enough to be an official parking space. Um, and so we're going to look at, you might remember when we did a, a change in Calvin where there were some steps coming down and we had to um, reduce the parking and we didn't have a full park length available to us, that we were going to trial out these triangle markings on the street that would allow for like a small car or a motorcycle to park there. So the suggestion is that in this one spot where the existing, there's an existing parking space but it's not actually a regulation size, that this is another place we could try out these triangular markings that sort of say you could park a small vehicle or a motorcycle in that space. So we don't want to, there's not a lot of parking here, we don't want to waste the space by just taking it out. So that was the slight change um, that the staff have worked through. Just to acknowledge some of the comments from Russell um, Taylor, I did ask that um, the staff again um, to make sure that, that our broken yellow lines are all you know, correctly marked and correctly gazetted, which is something that we always do when they're doing that, and they've reassured me that that's all correct. Um, we have looked, we have just spoken about um, when, the, when we do, next do the traffic resolutions and the images go out that we might be able to make the existing yellow lines a bit more visible. Then they're there, but they're not easy to see. You've got to strain your eyes. So that might be something that would be useful in future. So thanks, staff, for that suggestion. Um, I think... The one thing was that Russell raised was that there were some parts of the street that are 6.5 metres wide and therefore that we could have parking on both sides of the road. And I just wanted to, to acknowledge that um, while 6.5 is the minimum amount that we would where we would consider allowing parking on both sides of the street, we prefer to have 6.9 metres. And in the, two, in the two instances that Russell Taylor was saying the road is 6.5 metres, um, that doesn't account for the fact that there's, if there's a bank there and there are a number of trees growing out kind of into the road space. So even if you're measuring from gutter to gutter, you might have 6.5 metres, but in terms of the practical space that cars can park in and use, there actually isn't 6.5 metres of space in those in those areas. Um, so, you know, just acknowledging that that is something that the, the staff have looked really um, carefully at. And just thanking the public submitters who came in and, and all the residents who worked on, on bringing this about in Holloway Road. Um, you know, it's obviously a really important issue. I did want to just say in terms of avoiding painting twice, um, that I, from my point of view, this is an urgent safety issue, getting these broken yellow lines painted. Um, and that, you know, from what I understand, a bit of paint on the road is not that expensive. So if we're, if you're considering the timing of that, I think my, th my suggestion would be, I'd rather get the broken yellow lines on the road as quickly as we can. Um, if it's gonna cost us a few extra hundred dollars, um, I don't want another ambulance getting stuck up there because we were waiting for the resealing to be finished. So that's my little two cents worth on that one. <laughs> um, to Portmore Place in Granada Drive, where we had Craig Pomare come and speak to us, um, I think it was great that he came in because it's always so useful to hear from residents about what, the, what their issues are in terms of um, the speed and visibility. Again, the staff have committed to doing some further work there. They're going to investigate and have a look at the bank and whether that, there's anything can be done there, looking at signage. Um, they're going to do an investigation of the vehicle speeds, operating speeds around that area. So there will be some more changes that happen there. We, might not, we may not see them back at this table because we, if it's not a traffic resolution matter, it might not come back to us. But, um, you know, the staff have committed to doing some more work in that area to make sure that that area is safe. 
um, quickly talking about Abel Smith Street and the um, eucalyptus tree that's that's causing problems there and, and dropping litter. Um, I think you know obviously it's it's quite a frustration for this resident that he's been experiencing. It's a, um, at the moment it's a residence park and so obviously his car is um, you know covered in leaves quite often. Um, I think. You know, given that the car share company have said that they're not concerned about that in terms of damage to their cars and their property, um, if they continue to think that this is a good place to put a car share park, I, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with that. Um, I appreciate staff uh, are going to follow up with PSR to see if we can do anything about trimming the tree, but I think having looked at it on street view, um, it's a really big tree. And even if we were to trim a couple of branches off it, I think that's not actually going to solve the problem of leaf fall. So I think short of cutting that tree down entirely, we're not going to remove that, um, that issue from these, these spaces. Um, and I don't think we're particularly enthusiastic about the idea of cutting down a quite lovely large tree in the centre of the city um, if we can help it. So um, thank you to staff for looking into that, but I'm just kind of acknowledging that my expectations on that front are low. Um, I think that there's probably not much we can do about that. But given that the car share company have said they're fine with it, I feel like they're going into it with their eyes wide open. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm happy to support that traffic resolution as it stands. And Jen, just lastly to speak about the, the um, resolution on the terrace where we're moving the mobility parking, and Jonathan Coppard was asking, could we turn it into bike parking instead? Um, I think that's, I didn't know that we don't have any bike parking on the terrace uh, that's publicly available. So we've just added a little recommendation, if you can scroll down, thanks, Sean. Um, number three, just asking that we look into the provision of bike parking on the terrace. I didn't want to hold up this particular traffic resolution because this spot might not be the right spot for bike parking. Um, so let's get ahead and go ahead and, and move this mobility park to a better space. Um, but if we can then put that in the pipeline to look at whether there's somewhere on the terrace that would be more appropriate to provide bike parking for the public, that would be great. Um, the only other couple of ones I wanted to speak to are just to say some sort of thank you from the community or thank you for the work that's happening in the community. Um, the crossing that's in Island Bay on the Esplanade has been a long time in the works. There's been a lot of work again from staff and going out to the community and talking to the community through the options. And again, this is one that could have come to our table with a lot of no's um, and a lot of controversy and the fact that it's come and everybody's pretty happy is, again, I think a reflection of all the work that you've done to take the community on the journey. I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate that now that we've put this, once we get this in place, we might actually see that more pedestrians start to use that, that crossing. And if we actually get greater usage of that space, then we could look in the future at whether it's appropriate to introduce a raised table or a pedestrian crossing or something else. So I've asked staff to keep an eye on that um, in the hopes that, because one of the issues at the moment is that people cross all the way along there. So there's not one spot where there's enough traffic, pedestrian traffic to justify that. So maybe if the community, once this is installed, we might actually find that we can do more in that space, which would be lovely. And the staff are gonna keep an eye on that for us. And just to say on behalf, um, on behalf of the Johnsonville Community Association, um, whose meetings I regularly attend, thank you so much for the traffic resolution removing this bus stop. There's been a bus stop on in Johnsonville that hasn't been in use for quite some time. Um, and they've been, um, begging us to return it to, to parking spaces. So it's very exciting to see that traffic resolution come here. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm not going to speak to any of the others. They're all, we've got a whole bunch of pretty routine things today. So that's me. Can I have a seconder, please? Yes, I'm happy to second. I love traffic resolutions. I love regs. I love traffic resolutions. <laughs> um, uh, I guess just to add any any time we're moving more mobility parks. Um, I'm excited, you know, having more of them, I'm excited and it's really great to see um, a mobility parking space um, being created to uh, f support uh, participation from disabled people in community activities. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, and I guess just to note, I've just got a, seen a little message from Jonathan Coppard about the uh, car, about bike parking on the terrace and suggesting that um, that uh, that it could be on the street, um, that or you know, the, because it's a 30-kilometre area and they wouldn't consider it unsafe. So I know that there are issues there with some loss of revenue, but um, we also want to keep uh, footpaths for pedestrians. So um, so that's some good feedback there. And uh, thanks, officers, for their work. And um, yeah, that's it. So I'd like to thank officers for all their work. Is there any further debate at this point? 
Well, it's very pleasing to hear that um, the Riggs Committee is Rebecca Matthews, Councillor Matthews' happy place. <laughs> On that note, I put the motion which has been moved and seconded that we receive the information, approve all these um, traffic amendments. Please vote accordingly. Thank you very much, they're all carried. And again, thank you to officers for all your um, many hours of work that goes into these. It's appreciated. Yeah. And turning to our last item on the agenda, the development contribution remission request for 29 Brandon Street. I'd like to invite yeah, um, officers Mike Paddingwell and Nicole Tita to the table for questions. We have um, asked them a lot of questions already, but we may have more. Well, one I will ask you is right at the outset, we realised that, um, well, a mistake was made on the part of council, and are there, uh, can you assure us there are processes in place to ensure this doesn't happen again? Thanks. Firstly, just to mention the, um, the the officer who wrote the report, who um, made the calculation, is no longer with us. So just to just to mention that we have, in terms of uh, looking, in terms of how we might assess these reports in the future, we don't have the resources for a peer review type process for someone to review the report to review the report and the calculations each time. But Nicole and I have had a conversation about well, maybe for those ones that might be higher risk, like the commercial type ones. We could try and do that, so that's something we will look to do in the future. I'm also going to have a conversation with the City Consenting and Compliance Management team about other things we might be able to do about yeah, communication, how we communicate things better out. So there's a few different, and yeah, also just to talk to my, um, my management team about, about there's anything else that we might be able to do. So yeah, thank you for the question, yeah. And my understanding is that um, development contributions were not discussed along the way between 2017 and 2020, but there is the opportunity for us when improvements or additions are made that of themselves attract further development contributions of perhaps reminding the developer that there will be an increased charge because of those, and not necessarily telling them how much is going to be involved, because obviously that will take time and effort, but perhaps just... A, a, a reminder, if you become aware of it, that um, the changes or increased work will attract further, so yeah. that they're not taken by surprise at the end. Sure, certainly, and we have, that's one of the conversations we'll have about how we can be more proactive in communicating that kind of messaging, Council Sparrow, yes. Okay, thank you very much for that. Are there any other questions from councillors? Okay, well, I have a few comments to make um, because this is a is a very complex issue, and making the right decision is is not easy on our part. And to put it bluntly, if any one of us had been given an estimate of less than two and a half thousand for development contributions on a project that we were undertaking, and then once the project had been completed, got a bill out of the blue, if you like, for more than $116,000, I guess, I expect we would have been totally gobsmacked, ropeable, if not a whole lot more. And that was very likely the reaction of the developer, Cornerstone Group, whose request for a DC remission, de development contribution remission, that we, we are considering, considering right now. As we're well aware, the development contribution for this project was incorrectly estimated in 2017 to be $2,273.14. So that's under $2,300. The correct figure at that stage would have been $92,782.83, so almost $90,000 more. The initial mistake is 
very regrettable, and Council has already expressed its apology that it ever happened, but it did happen, and we, we echo that sentiment too. Along the way, the developer made changes to the project which increased the gross floor area by 216 square metres, which equates to an increased development contribution of 23,366.18. So that amount, plus the 92,782, adds up to the 116,149, which we are now talking about. It is pointed out to any applicant at the outset that any changes made to a project are likely to alter the development contribution level. So it was always going to have 23,366 added for the changes along the way. As we've already said, it appears that the um, issue of development contributions was not discussed between 2017 and 2020, even with the changes that were made along the way but it didn't have to be. The total project value exceeded $20 million, therefore the development contribution portion is under point, or under 0.6% of the total project. If the developer had known in advance that the development contribution component would end up at $116,000, would it have affected their decision in terms of the project, in terms of the overall project? Well, I think it's fair to say it probably wouldn't. Application of Council's usual development contribution formula has been applied in this instance. We do not take into account individual circumstances. That is, what parts of Council infrastructure the revamped, the revamped building may be benefiting from or not. In the same way, we don't take into account the individual circumstances of city ratepayers, what city facilities they may be using or not using. The only factor for our consideration is what level of remission we apply, and that's the purpose of this discussion here, if any, because the original estimate supplied by Council was incorrect. And although the developer would have re received a rude shock on being invoiced many thousands more than anticipated, and we concede that was ca the case, the, rea the reality is that $116,149.01 is the correct development contribution required for this particular project. As an act of goodwill, officers have suggested remitting the development contribution by 20%, which equates to a deduction of $23,229.81 to compensate for Council's initial error. And having weighed up all the factors, and we have had serious discussion amongst Councillors prior to this meeting and have met with officers and discussed this at some length, it certainly is not an easy decision for this committee to make, but I think, and I think most of us here, if not all of us, agree that 20% is about right. It acknowledges a mistake was made, but that development contributions are still required for this project, as with any other similar development. That's the end of my <laughs> comments. Councillor Matthews. Second, if you... Um, Yes, I'd, ju I'd just like to echo um, the apology um, that we are sorry that this mistake was made and I think it's important that you know we say that as councillors and we get into the habit of when our organisation or you know us individually we make mistakes or that we take responsibility and try and fix them. So I think this is a good opportunity to learn and improve um, both in the checks and balances and in the communication around development contributions because uh, development contributions are only going to become more important, um, that we need development in the city, particularly of housing, and that uh, we obviously have serious problems with our infrastructure, um, particularly in water. So, you know, this, I don't think that, well, I support the 20% um, uh, remittance, but I also think this shouldn't be viewed as any precedent that um, 
we are going to loosen up our kind of attitudes on development contributions because we cannot afford to. Everybody has to um, contribute to uh, the essential infrastructure we need to um, keep the city going and especially to find places for, and it doesn't apply in this case, but for places for people to live. So yes, happy to second and, and support the recommendation. Thank you for your comments, Councillor Matthews. Any any debate? Councillor Condy. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to start by um, also making an apology for this mistake and also for thanking staff for their response to this mistake because I think everybody makes mistakes. Yes. Mistakes happen. Um, that's a reality of life. Uh, but it's how you respond once you find them. And I think what I've seen is that um, the mistake was found, immediately acknowledged, addressed as quickly as possible, and that you've worked really um, constructively with the, the developer to try and, and find a way through this. So I really want to thank you. That's the kind of organisational culture that we want to see. Um, um, so while we might be disappointed a mistake was made, I'm very proud of how the organisation has responded since the mistake has been discovered. So thank you for that. Um, I guess one of the things I was considering when I was looking at this is that developers know the development contribution policy. They use it all the time. So there was, for me, there was a sense of, should they have known when they got this very small $2,000 bill that that was wrong? that they should have, they knew it well enough that they should know they were going to have to pay more. But actually, when we when you dig into it here, what we find is that it, um, it actually has to do with a, a fairly esoteric bit of our development contribution policy around converting parking spaces into commercial space. And that's not a bit of the DC policy we would necessarily expect even frequent flyers um, to be over the details there. So there's really, there was no reason why they should have been suspicious when they got that $2,000 estimate. Um, I think because they were given the wrong information at that point in time, they missed the opportunity to possibly alter their design or consider whether they wanted to make any changes to the design that would have affected their development contribution. And we do sometimes have that happen, where a developer will come in with a design, they'll be told what the development contribution is, and there'll be some working back and forth between the staff, officers at council, and the developer to, to figure out whether there's some adjustments that could be made that would lower the development contribution. I think because that opportunity was missed in this case, I think it's... it's um, appropriate for us to acknowledge that there was some potential um, you know, fin financial loss by losing that opportunity. So I think some discount is appropriate in this case. Um, it might not always be appropriate, but I, because of those specific circumstances, I think it is appropriate in this particular circumstance. The other thing that I certainly had in mind was that you know, we're working on our long-term plan, and I think you know, we're about to go out to our community and ask them to um, pay a lot more for improving our infrastructure around water and transport. Um, and that's going to include us going to, you know, superannuitants on fixed incomes and asking them to pay their share. Um, and so it, it certainly feels like at the moment we, we also need, we can't be turning around to a very successful commercial enterprise um, and, and not asking them to pay, pay their share. That just doesn't, doesn't feel fair. Um, in this case, I'm not sure there is a right number, but 20% feels about right. Um, and so I think that I'll be supporting that recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Condi. Councillor Neil. Yeah, just to briefly um, echo some of the points of my colleagues and start by acknowledging the mistake and the responsibility of council to do things right um, and understanding uh, that development contributions are in place in order to accommodate for city's growth and infrastructure, so they are really important. And that is, um, that's probably the, the core reason why uh, um, I'm supporting the 20% um, acknowledgement of wrongdoing because we all still need to pay our fair share and um, to understand why we have the policy in place is equally important. And then um, just briefly to thank Cornerstone Properties for being such good sports um, and uh, and the officers working really hard to make sure that there's super clear communication. Um, I think this is a pretty good outcome considering the circumstances. And yeah, happy to support. Thank you. The motion has been moved and seconded. I um, recommend we receive the information and agree to de remit the de development contributions by 20%, leaving a balance of $92,919.20 owing. Please vote <laughs> accordingly. Thank you for that, the motion is carried.
Yeah, thank you very much, officers. Appreciate all the time you've given to this. I ask that we now stand to say the closing karakia. Unu here, unu here, unu here, kite uru tapunui. Kia wātea, kia mama, te mākou, te tilina, te wairua. I te ara takatū. Koe ara e rongu, whakāria ake ki runga. Kia wātea, kia wātea, kia ara, kua wātea. Thank you very much, everyone and officers. I declare the meeting closed at... Yeah.